we've assembled some of our amazing sculptors. There's more in the, in the tent, but um, what we wanted to do today was have these guys share with you a little bit about how you go from just a normal tabletop size sculpture into the monumental size. And then we're going to talk also about the process of public art, because I think that might be really interesting to some of you. So uh, my name's Susan, along with my husband Jake, and an amazing team of people were the ones that put the show together, and we thank all of you for, for joining us. <laughs> and uh, again, we're honored today to have four of our awesome sculptors, um, Paul Reimer from Maryland, Bryce Pettit from Durango, Tyson Snow from Provo, Somewhere in Utah. Yeah, somewhere in Utah. Somewhere in Utah. <laughs> and Todd Paxton from Santa Fe. So these guys come from all over the country working um, at their home studios, but during this time of year, they're right here sculpting on site. So uh, we welcome all of you, and I'm going to start by having you just tell a tiny bit about you, how long you've been sculpting, or whatever you want to know about you. And then we'll go from there to the big stuff. Mm -hmm. Hi, I. I'm Paul Reimer, and um, I'm a sculptor from Maryland. I've been sculpting for bronze for not quite 20 years, and I did model making a taxidermy before that. Uh, so, uh, and before that, I did painting. So, I've been doing art stuff my whole life, uh, but started doing the bronze stuff about in the late 90s. So, uh, here I am. Uh, Bryce Pettit from Durango, Colorado, and I've been doing art full time for almost 20 years, and coming to this show for 16. Is it not on? It doesn't feel like it's going. I hear it. Yeah, yeah, it's okay. Closer. I can hear it. Yeah, but this one's got a dead battery. No? Okay. Oh. Is that better? Yeah. All right. Bryce Pettit from Durango, Colorado. I, uh, just to repeat myself, sorry for the front row. Um, been sculpting full time for about 20 years, and coming to this show, I think this is my 16th year here. Woo wow. Uh, Tyson Snow, my first year here, but I've been sculpting for about 15 years. And Hold it like an ice cream cone. It's like an ice cream cone. Yeah. 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 What if you don't eat ice cream cones? Yeah. All right, so um, I, I've been sculpting for about 15 years. Uh, always an artist, always drawing and painting, but uh, working with bronze primarily for about, about 15. That makes me the new kid on the block because uh, I was a plumber. <laughs> then, uh, uh, I mean, but I, you know, art is always part of your life if you love it when you're young. But uh, I bought a foundry about 10 years ago in 07. I guess that's eight years. Yeah. Anyhow, I uh, bought a foundry and decided, hey, I'm going to do this. And started sculpting, and that was 07. And so, a little under 10 years I've been sculpting. Wow, that's great. Okay, so today's topic is making of the monument. So one thing that they all have in common is that they have done things life size or larger than life size. And um, again, some of you have gone through the process of going through a public process of getting your art selected to be placed in the public spot. But I think I'd like to start with Bryce, who can give us maybe an example of how it goes from this size to that size. Okay, um, so just to start off, I would like, it, obviously I didn't get enough and it's concentrated towards the front, but I thought as a fun little visual aid, I would have a monumental Hershey's Kiss <laughs> as well as it. So help yourself to all that. <laughs> um, it's the same, the same idea as monuments. You do a small, um, maquette is called, uh, which is French for model or doll, and then you make a large size version of it. Um, usually you work out a small piece first just to figure out the compositional things because the monuments tend to be more of a, in my opinion, they tend to be more of like a, an engineering project. You're taking a concept or an idea and a form and you're trying to figure out how to make it bigger. A lot more goes into the construction and every, uh, into the construction and understanding how it will be strong enough to hold up in public and how to make it that size then goes into the smaller pieces. Um, I think it's a really great example. Todd's here, you can look over at his the big Indian monument that he's doing, and if you look to the left, you can see that he did a smaller one there, 
that's to work out the composition, to figure out how we want it to be. And when he goes up to the larger size, he has proportional calipers, which I hope we can maybe grab. Yeah. And like, um, it uses that. It's an exact scale model of the, the smaller ones because it's very easy in the large size to kind of get off track. When you're looking, when you're standing arm length away from a monument, you're really only looking at this teeny little patch and it's hard, at least for me, to keep track of the proportions. Um, when Todd, I mean, he'll, you go, they're your tool, I need to explain this. So there's not like a machine, you just put it in and it grows it, makes it bigger? There's a number of digital options that are now available for sculptures in which you scan, do a laser scan of the, um, of the smaller sculpture and then you can mill it out in foam. There are some limitations to that. It's just like blowing up a photograph. If you take just any old photograph and you blow it up, different things don't look good. You get pixelation, you have all those kind of things. Same sort of principles apply to a large one. And probably all of us are going to have a different way or a different opinion about the, the, the weaknesses and strengths of those methods and we all have different ways we like to point it up, which is what that's called. You take a small model and you by proportion make it larger. Yeah, I think that uh, sculptors have always used some sort of machine to help them to get from their small maquette that they've put together to a big. That's what pointing is all about, is finding a point in 3D space that that point is here and it's on a small one. Now it's way up here on this big one. But to find that space, you have to have a machine and there's been lots of different types of machines like Mount Rushmore. The guy who sculpted that, the main head sculptor, used an ancient machine that nobody really used and doesn't work very well, but he used it to make this amazing huge sculpture. This is probably the simplest machine you're going to find in the fact that it has a pivot point with two uh, calipers on either side. And I've got this one set for the big guy and I use me as the, the uh, so like, there's my head, and his head will be that, that big. You can kind of see the, the difference between the two, and that's just to help keep things in proportion as you're working them out, if you don't have a, a more complicated machine to do it with. <laughs> would it be safe to say that any mistakes would be much more obvious in a large size? Yeah, I think that's what Bryce was saying. If you if you have a computer, do it. You scan it, 3D model on the computer, and boom, it wax it out of a big giant block of clay or of a foam, and then they put clay on it. And what was a, a mistake about that big in your little maquette is now that big on your uh, your piece. And yeah, you'll you'll see all of your flaws immediately, and that's <laughs> no good. Yeah. And so will everyone else. Um, I want to kind of step back just a minute before we get too deep in this and ask each of you why you chose to sculpt, what attracted you to that, and then maybe who has inspired you. Um, it could be yourself, but who's inspired you to work that you've been inspired by, or um, you know, maybe a little secret like what you used to do and why it led you to becoming a full-time fine artist in sculpting. Um, I did, um, I had a career in um, model making and taxidermy. My dad was a taxidermist and I didn't really intend to do that, but opportunity in my early 20s came by to get a really good job doing that. And so I did that and made a career out of that. And for a lot of taxidermists, they, the next step for them to their art is sculpture. And sort of the father of modern taxidermists is a guy named Carl Akeley and he also did sculpture, and so a lot of the animal sculptors that I know are, like myself, recovering taxidermists. <laughs> so um, that's sort of where I got that, you know, doing, you know, working with animals and that sort of thing. You have a love for them, but you also get a very intimate knowledge of those things. So uh, that's sort of where I got, um, you know, sort of that, the original idea to do that. My artistic, um, uh, sort of inspirations historically uh, run from like the Impressionists, which uh, getting away from like my model making and taxidermy career, my style tends to be sort of vaguely Impressionistic, so that's a big deal. Um, and then some people like Rembrandt Bugatti and, and um, 
Barry or the, some of these uh, European guys from the 19th century that did these incredible animal sculptures. They're some of my um, inspirations. And there's plenty of current day sculptors and artists that inspire me um, and continue to inspire me, people in this tent. Um, so uh, that's sort of like kind of where, sort of the evolution of where I, sort of my path uh, to sculpting. By the way, these are the two animal guys. <laughs> and these guys are more figurative, although all of them can do anything, but that's generally where they fall. So, Bryce. Um, so, I feel like art is, for me, art is the kind of culmination of all of the products of my life. I love animals, I love nature, you can see that in my work. I've also been a person who's always loved to work with my hands. Some of my earliest memories go back to uh, whittling, you know, wood carvings and, and building things. I've always had a very tactile sense of, of exploring the world. And so as I played around with all different types of art uh, through my childhood, um, just a passion to create, passion to create something when I first began experimenting with 3D work with clay and stone, it clicked so well for me because it's combining my creative impulse along with my tactile way of exploring the world. So that's how I, I came into sculpture. Um, I, I went to school in animal studies I, as a biologist, um, and you can see those sort of influences in my work as well. Uh, this Okay, the ice cream kind of thing. Okay. Um, I'm a people person, so people are important to me. Who they are, things that happen to them have always been uh, important to me. And so I, I guess I've naturally, my work naturally focuses on the, the human form and figure. And uh, one of my first recollections of, because I've always drawn and painted, and I find those things that lend themselves very well. Drawing really is the, the sort of the fundamental for every, fundamental for every, um, you really have to eat this thing, don't you? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> You're not sick, are you? I'm sorry. <laughs> you might be after, after I hand this over. Okay, so, um, anyway, uh, always drawn, and I find that drawing really is the fundamentals for every, any, uh, um, medium uh, and discipline. Sculpture really is uh, three-dimensional drawing. And so when I was in high school though, I decided to, I was always influenced by the old masters, by Bernini, by Michelangelo, loved the stone carvings. And around Christmas time, I, I had one of those popcorn uh, tins, you know, that popcorn comes in, and, and all of it was, of course it was eaten. I, I mixed up plaster, poured it in, and let it set up and broke it off that and then with some really cheap wood uh, uh, chisels I lay oh, I, I didn't have a workspace obviously but I put a, a blanket on the floor and everything was on the floor and I lay next to this thing and for hours would sort of chisel away and I, I started to sort of I revealed ahead and I'd never done it before and I hadn't had any um, instruction either and but even now I look back on that head and I'm pretty interested it's interesting how well it was done. I mean, not to toot my own horn, so I, I really feel like it's kind of come with me. It's really a gift, but um, what I learned by that was that I never tired of it. Hour after hour, I lay there working on this thing, and I, and I, I loved it. And so I thought, hey, sculpture is really my thing. And so I've just continued to kind of uh, to build from there. <laughs> That's good. I was thinking about that. I just talked to a, fel uh, a person this morning, and. <laughs> He was like, wow, you must have the patience of, you know, whatever. I, and I was like, man, I'm the least patient person that ever was. How could that be? But he's right. I spent hours, just like Tyson just said, just, man, when you're into it, you are so into it, and it just time floats away. For me, I, I always loved art, always did art, but I never got my hands on sculpting clay until my friend who was working for a sculptor in his foundry, kind of running his foundry uh, up in Chinle, Arizona, uh, I went to visit him and everybody was going to see the county fair and I was like, ah, I don't like county fairs, I don't wanna go see that. He's like, well, hey, this is how you make an armature, here's some clay, go at it. And it was the funnest, somehow it just happened so quickly and easily 
that I loved it immediately and then I went home and bought more clay and just started sculpting more and within that year Ken was going to shut down his foundry and I was like well, maybe I could buy it you know I want to <laughs> sculpt <laughs> and I did and we went into crazy debt and we moved and that was all right at the recession and right before 07 and uh, but I think that's the thing is that you find what you love, and then you find something that's easy about what you love, and it makes it, not that it's not hard to work hard and get better and, and strive to do better, but it's just that little jump start that I think most people miss when they're going to start something, they try it, and it's like, oh, it's very hard. Nah, I don't like that. But for someone that's easy, like, yeah, that was fun, I'll do some more. And then they get better and better and better, and pretty soon, how do they do that? Well, they love it, and they've been doing it for a long time. And I don't know. It's yeah. Sorry. That's and, who, and who has influenced you? Who? Oh, oh, influences. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, that's what the question was, wasn't it? That's right. My bad. My bad. Uh, I think more modern sculptors have influenced me early on. Uh, like uh, I would see uh, sculptors like these guys right here. Or uh, John Coleman, uh, he's, he's, he does what I do, but he does it like, oh, goodness, it's so good. I'll always be inspired by him. But lately, in this last year and a half, old masters have been, you know, Michelangelo, Jean Bologna, uh, uh, Donatello, all these ones that you're like, you know their names? And you know they're masters, but have you really figured out why they're masters and what their work looks like? And I've been researching it more, and the more I find out about them, the more it inspires me to become way better than I am and to just try and be uh, even a sliver of that uh, genius that they were. So I think that's one common thread. Every Friday we hear, every year that we've done this, Everybody here has that desire to get better and better. And we also find every Friday that there's a lot of science to art, like calipers and scaling up and all that kind of thing. Um, you touched on something I want you to expand on, if you will, Todd, is you used the word armature. Can you explain to this group what might be helping to hold up the clay? Right, right. So the clay. That I think all of us use a plastiline clay that's oil-based, has wax in it. It's real sticky, but it doesn't ever dry out, and that's the benefit of it. It's not better to use than a terracotta clay, but it's just more convenient in the fact that you can work on a piece for a long time and not worry about moisture content and is it going to dry out and crack and what that's going to happen. Too so, sorry. Uh, where was that? Oh, okay. armature. So the clay is soft and can't hold itself. ADD or ADHD, what are you gonna do? <laughs> but all of our smaller uh, scaled uh, pieces will have armature in them, but it's usually just aluminum wire because it's very easy to bend and manipulate to the point that you want. It's usually held up with some sort of stand, but for something big and monumental, now you have to have uh, something that can handle that weight but and be strong because you do not want something to slowly start losing it as you're sculpting because then you're done. So uh, usually you use steel. Like my big guy, he's got a big steel uh, skeleton inside of him. Uh, even the smaller dancer, she's too heavy for just a regular wire armature. So she has to have steel inside. And that's where uh, I think Bryce brought out about how the maquette helps you to figure out all the problems before you get there because once you weld that steel, you get it down where it's going to go. There's no moving it after the clay is on it. You can't just grab an arm and now I want it over here or over there. Moving it is very difficult. So uh, that's one part is the steel frame, but then there's more to that. I think uh, Paul has more experience than I will ever have about using uh, foam on the inside to create uh, uh, fill in the cavity that you don't have to have clay to sculpt there, but to keep the weight down and to make it where you could move it around. 
I'm going to pass that off. That's what that was. So some of that plumbing experience with those pipes you yeah. used to use come in handy for building the... Uh, yeah, the actually, yeah, sometimes, yeah. And it's all very... For me, it's so fun because part of what I love to do is invent. And like the big guy, I could have just welded big rods together to make him. If you're interested, I can show you pictures of what's inside of him. But I wanted to make an armature that I could use again and pose however I wanted. And I don't know if you know this, but the joints on the body are ridiculous. They can go all over the place. So how do you replicate, replicate that? And so I had a lot of fun inventing joints that would move in every which way for that guy's steel frame. So I could pose him in the gesture that I wanted before I ever even started putting foam or clay on him. And when I'm done with him and I rip the clay off and I tear the foam off, that frame I will pose again and use again. I'm really excited to see how it holds up. Very cool. So I had a friend in last week who'd never been here before, and he was like, oh my gosh, this is amazing. And he walked by your Indian and he kind of touched him and he goes, this is wet. <laughs> <laughs> it's clay. <laughs> so, and I had just heard my friend Bryce share when we were with Fox News before, and I sounded really clever, and I said, well, there's about 12 steps between here and when it becomes bronze. Can you speak to those 12 steps? Um, I guess it depends how you decide which step is a step, but there are, it, the whole casting process, especially on a monument, is a multi-month project. Uh, Paul is just finishing up a big monument now, and that started over a year ago. That's typically how long it takes to do a big monument project. First you do the maquette, you figure out all the design details then, then you start to, to do the sculpting on the large one. And then um, once you have the sculpting looking exactly how you want it, the, it goes through the traditional casting process in that you do a mold, you do a wax replica of the clay, you coat the, the wax in a ceramic shell and then do the bronze pour into there. All the assembly. Another thing that happens often on the um, on the big monuments is you need to think about internal structure. Bronze itself is very strong, but um, I did a 12-foot a, a wingspan uh, pelican last year, and I have a little maquette for it over here, and that all came down to a steel pin that was only three inches in diameter because of the place in which it was, uh, where it was placed. And so that piece had to have a, a, a pretty extensive stainless steel armature underneath it, even in the bronze. It was more like a stainless steel column with the bronze shell over the top of it. Some engineering things that go along with some of the bigger projects. Yeah. Thank you, Susan. We had, this, we had this giant one here last year. It was here for just a short time before it had to be delivered to, the, yeah. Um, yeah. to Oklahoma where it was installed. Yeah. So, Paul, since you recently, I, we're not very formal here. So, um, I just want to brag. I know I've known these two guys longer, Paul and, and Bryce, and they participate in a really exciting exhibit in, in Tulsa, which is the Nature Works. Nature Works, which is all nature. And there's a competition there every year amongst the artists to receive an award to have their piece selected as a monument to be installed in the city of Tulsa. And I think the two of you have taken turns <laughs> almost for the last five or six years being the recipient of the award. And this was Bryce's last year installation. And then Paul took last year's competition was Polar Bear. Polar Bear. So each year they're given a specific, species. I hate to say animal, species. And everyone submits that species, like Bryce won this guy. And so when Paul went last year and submitted his polar bear, he was selected as the winner and spent much of the last year creating that. And there's some great photos that we can maybe show of him at one point kind of reworking the, the length of the bear to be just right. And you want to share a little bit about that process? Sure. Um, we, uh, these guys have been talking about different armatures. I did a polar bear, it's a, a really big bear, but it's life size. It's seven feet long from the nose to the bump and seven feet high. I didn't have any metal in it whatsoever. Um, I created it 
uh, all by carving foam. Um, <clears throat> that's not true, I did have a little metal in it, but, but the armature, that was mostly just to hold the foam up. So what I did was, um, we took and made um, a plaster, um, this is part of my maquette. This is my maquette of the bear. So now it's seven feet from there to there. Okay, thank you, Bryce. So I pulled a plaster out of the mold, and um, my wife uh, took about three dozen photographs of this thing from different points of view, and um, then basically put it into a computer program and created a, a three-dimensional uh, 3D image of it, and we put it into another program, and then said, I want it to be seven feet long. And then that program will also, if you delineate how thick you want the sections to be, it, we say two inches, and so it just cuts it up into two inch sections. And then you transfer those, those shapes, and then it basically makes a big topo map of a bear. And so I glued all those foam pieces together. We cut them out and glued them all together. And um, then we realized, hold this up. A cardinal rule of showing you what is wrong is that at 12 inches, it looks okay, but at seven feet, this neck is way too long. <laughs> and, these, and this is a pretty leggy bear. Um, thank you. Uh, so once I had the foam, then I, I posted these time-lapse videos, and I cut all of the legs off. Every leg was cut off at least four times and moved. And some of them were cut off six and seven times. The neck was shortened and lengthened and shortened, and the head was changed. But with the foam, it's very easy. And so once the foam was all carved, um, I mean, I got it down to where I only needed to put, you know, like less than an inch of clay over the whole thing. So I sculpted this seven foot bear with less than 200 pounds of clay, which I'm sure you have way more than that. <laughs> um, I think I'm about 400 pounds of clay right now. Yeah, yeah. and at $5 a pound, it's not a, it's not a small thing. And then the foam is really easy to move around. There's no metal in it, so it's a, just a completely different way of doing it. And since the bear was big and massy, it, it would be harder to do with his because the legs are thinner, you know. So it's just a different kind of way of going about doing it. So. And I know you have some photos of that. I do have some photos, and probably the easiest thing to do is just come by afterwards, yeah. and I can show you. I have a lot on the iPad, but I did some really fun videos of me, you know cutting you know with a sawzall I did a lot of sculpting with the sawzall and um, and I spent literally the whole summer just working the foam and then once the clay went on I probably only spent a month on it maybe not even a month with the clay just getting it the way I wanted it but by the time the clay was on it was pretty close so it's a different way of doing it it's a different way of doing it an enlargement we were Susan was at the National Sculpture Society thing there, and, and I was there after I had put this whole bear together in foam. And um, there were these guys there who do these digital enlargements, and I was telling them what I was doing. They said, oh, you should have let us cut that foam for you. I said, dude, there's no way you could do it for that price. And he goes, oh, you shouldn't give us a chance. And I said, all right, let's just get our pencils out. So I just went and did a quick little thing. Like, the foam was 200 bucks. Uh, the pipe that I put inside was 200 bucks. And then I just calculated my studio assistant's hours, and I said, okay, I put this together for 850 bucks. And he's like, yeah, no, we couldn't do that. <laughs> so sometimes, and, and this is, we can probably, I don't know if you want to segue into the idea of public art, but public art can sometimes not be that profitable. I mean, oh, unlike the millions that I make as a wildlife sculptor. <laughs> uh, so um, sometimes the budgets are incredibly tight and even though you want to try to figure out, you know, how to be as economical as possible, sometimes, the, you know, the budget really drives your process. Uh, it's like, how can I do this for this, this amount of money? So, go ahead. So, um, Allison and I uh, live in Durango, and there uh, was a bunch of new highway construction things being done, and they created a new median space at the two intersections of the major highways coming through town, and opened it up for artists. Now, it's a, it's a, they got an NEA grant to do it, and this whole project, because it's a large space and because of what they're trying to do, has basically been a, uh, a combination game of trying to figure out what we can do for the budget. Alice and I, have, uh, we have to go up week after next and have another meeting with all. He'll be looking to move from a six inch 
the six inch figures to a half life size. Uh, and I'll be going to help scale that up and to produce that. How big is the half life going to be? The half life scale is going to be 40 feet long. So <laughs> it's going to be monumental. Uh, uh, the figures in the foreground will be seven feet tall. It will be probably over 80 feet long. And it will be in DC. And it will be installed? It'll be in, well, I, I don't know. I, I've been talking to him for about four years, and every time he talks to me, he says, in about a year from now, <laughs> and it's been about four years, but now the model is finished, congressional committee is ready to move on to the next step, so, so things should be moving forward more quickly for that project. I just want to say in front of all of you, though, I've already told um, Tyson that I'm happy he's going to help with this amazing project. But he has to make time to be back here next year. I will do my best. <laughs> Apparently, this model might take two years to, to, to do, and that's not even the final, so. Wow. And what, what is it about that project that inspires you? I, I, where, where do I begin? I mean, it's, it's, it's highly figurative. It's very beautiful. It's moving. It focuses on a major world war, which is the Forgotten War. And then, so. There were so many lives that were affected. Millions and millions and millions of people perished. And it's one that, a monument that doesn't exist. Uh, I think there's a dilapidated stone gazebo in DC right now, off the mall, which is the World War I monument. So this one is a long time coming. And I think that we work in a very similar way. Our styles are similar. And so I think we'll work, we'll work well together on, on this project. That's amazing. Yeah. That's, that's an incredible project. Yeah. Yeah. I, I can't take credit for it. I didn't do that. That's, again, that's safe and powered, but I'll be, I'll be assisting him with, with that. So I, I think that also speaks to um, the, the sense of community and camaraderie in not just here at the show, which we have a huge amount of that camaraderie, collaboration, and, and helpfulness, but really excellent artists, just like any industry, uh, find each other. Mm -hmm. And they inspire each other, and to do to work on a project like that together means an awful lot. And um, one of the things, as, as Paul mentioned, last June I went um, along to the National Sculpture Society Conference in New York, which was an amazing gathering of artists. Um, we should talk a little bit about that, but how they come together, the panels that they had, they had a really great competition for, um, they were all under age 35 or something? Under 40. Under 40. They they had, was it four hours? It's like a, Six. It's like a three hour sculpt from a model. Like you a do a bust quick draw. Of, a, of a model, three hours, and it's all sculptors under 40, and you're there watching them put these things together, and the models, it's like a circle of sculptors, and the model's there, and then every 15 minutes they move, and they do busts, and uh, I mean, the kind of talent that those young twerks are. <laughs> yeah, it was, it's intimidating. It's it was really amazing. amazing, and then there was a great event at the St. John the Divine, which Well, the other thing that Stan's mentioning is that uh, Stephanie Revenal, uh, won a very prestigious award, the Maryland Newmark Award for Animal Sculptor, sculpture, which is, she beat out some amazing sculptors, um, and just well deserved, I'm tickled to death that she won, even though she beat me. <laughs> she, she was like, I hate her. Yeah, she's, she's her, where is she? Did she take off? I saw her. She's, she's in her space. Um, and then, next year, this National Sculpture Society conference is at, uh, beautiful place called Brook Green Gardens. Has anyone been there? <laughs> yeah, it's like, it's like the sculpture mecca. It's got the largest figurative sculpture collection Where is it at? in the country. Where is it? It's just outside of South, uh, Myrtle Beach, South, South Carolina. Carolina. And uh, it's, a, it's a phenomenal place for, for sculpture. Amazing gardens, which in the, themselves are exquisitely beautiful. Hundreds and hundreds of acres and amazing collections of outdoor sculptures and indoor exhibits. Uh, it is like my mecca. I, I go at least once, if not twice a year. It's a phenomenal place. It's almost like this dreamland because it, it, it's, I don't know how many acres? 100 like, acres? Like 5,000 acres. Okay. 5,000, whatever. But I mean, it goes on and on. And uh, the live oak trees and the pathways lined with sculpture and the ponds and the. So if you are a sculpture lover, 
put Brookering Gardens on your list of places to go and, and experience, um, definitely. And in the spring, not, when it's not too hot. Yeah, go humid. Yeah. yeah, or now. So, um, all right, I'm gonna bounce it back to Bryce a little bit. You have some photographs up here, which I would love to pass around and share a little bit about how that process happened, the installation. And aside from submitting and being awarded the thing, then you got to sculpt it and then you have to install it. Not that easy. Yeah, often the installation has got its uh, own challenges as well. It's just kind of a collection of some of the some recent projects, and we can just pass it around. Um, this is the installation of the, the Pelican piece. You can see it was meant to suspend out over the Arkansas River, and so there's a big steel post that stuck out there, and we had to lift it out over the river with a crane and somehow get that three-inch pin exactly in a three and one-eighth inch hole it's straight down. At one point, I was standing there with ropes on the, the head and the tail like I was with a rain of horses trying to direct it in there. I thought I was going to get pulled over the bridge. It was That was a very nerve-wracking installation. These are my boys here with me. At, uh, this is a sculpture I did of my daughter for her elementary school. She was embarrassed at the time. Now she's starting to think it's not so bad. <laughs> and this is at the Tulsa Airport. This is a piece I did in, at the Maritime Museum on the Great Lakes in Michigan, uh, sport fishing monument. And, Anyway, yeah, we can pass that around. It's it, it it's nothing very uh, it's awesome comprehensive, it's but awesome. It, it give you an idea of some of the bigger projects. Even in, even installing the courtyard here or or the sculpture here, uh, I hate to even say something like I, I just hold my breath when we were bringing the pelican in and or no when we were bringing in the flights of, of learning. And you know we've got three guys carrying it in. You know my husband. I'm like, don't drop it. <laughs> and then, like last year, Stephanie Rebna, she doesn't have that big. She had the jut. She had like a monumental size of that horse head that's right there. And it was um, it displayed on top of this wooden box. And I walked by during setup. That that's like a whole nother thing to understand what goes into setting this up, but. All of a sudden I see uh, the box and like Stephanie's foot and the guys are leaving the box for and Stephanie's under there with, with uh, lug nuts or whatever. <laughs> I'm like, oh my gosh. But that's what you do. There's like the, the, the non-glamorous side of the art business is you, you gotta grind it out and you gotta work and you, you gotta hang out over the bridge while your sculpture's going in. And that's gotta be awe-inspiring. Some of these larger projects, uh, there's, there truly is it like engineering stamps. You have to be able to stay withstand the wind and the uh, the elements. the The joke at the foundry is that every public card needs to pass the 300 pound drunk man test. You know, like, so there's all that kind of thing that goes into it. <laughs> because once you put it out there, it's part of the public interaction, and people are going to touch it. So in the write up about this series, I talked about all of us have been inspired and, and seen public art. Do any of you have, you know, favorite works of art that you've seen, including maybe the monuments in, in DC or anywhere that, you know, really remind you of a specific place, take you there? Henry Wall. Henry Wall. Henry Wall had an exhibit all through Kew Gardens, which is just outside of London. Okay. Henry Moore. Um, who else? Yes. The giant rabbit going down the oh, yeah. hole at the Sacramento Airport. Yeah. 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 Who did that? You guys know? Yeah. It's big and red. I remember yeah. that. Yeah. <laughs> the Alice in Wonderland. Yeah. Oh yeah, that's cool. Oh yeah. Central Park, Alice in Wonderland, and even here in town, like uh, the hash hash knife. Ed Melpies right down at Marshall Way in, in Maine. And, um, one of the things I like about public art too is when, when you've seen them year after year and, and where people touch them, because you know, they tell us not to touch art, but I think sculpture invites you to touch it and you get the shiny, and then it's all of a sudden the shoulder's all shiny where people touch it. Um, another one that I love and, and Anne, you know, we've saw it together, the, the Glenda Goodacre. Um, how many of you are familiar with Glenda Goodacre? 
Okay, so this is an all guy panel, but there are some, you know, awesome female sculptors as well. Glenna, in my opinion, is one of the absolute best, and um, she did a beautiful piece for the World War II uh, women, the nurses. Vietnam. Vietnam, sorry, sorry. Um, but just, the, I'm sorry? On the mall in Washington, yeah. So, what other, what other pieces have inspired you? Like, what made you want to do a giant? Uh -huh. Good question. Uh, <laughs> you know, I guess it's whenever you get, this is my feelings about uh, uh, monumental site sculpture. We call it monumentals, and I had somebody say, oh, well, what's it monument, you know, what is it memento using? Some people think of monumental as something different. For me, it's anything life-size or bigger is a monumental in my mind. Yeah. And uh, every time I've seen something that is life-size, I always go, it's small. Just feel small. You know, it's just maybe it's not on a big enough pedestal or something. But uh, when it's bigger than life, all of a sudden, it even if it's a bad sculpture, it garnishes attention. It makes you look because, oh my gosh, it's big. And I've had a lot of people look at that guy there and go, ooh, he's a big guy, huh? And that's <laughs> not a compliment to me because, yeah, he's big. And the compliment comes when the presence means more than just it's big. But that's why I've always wanted to do something big is because it is powerful. Even if whatever statement you're saying has now got a megaphone in front of it, and it's screaming it at you, and you've got to get that that feeling from it, because it's so big, it's so awesome. That I was thinking of the that sculpture, the Alice in Wonderland, and right next to the Met in New York. I remember first walking by that, and that was probably one of the first times. That was long before I was sculpting, and I remember walking by and going, "That is awesome, and it's so powerful because it's huge. It's a giant mushroom, and she's there, and everything. The whole story plays out." And it's so powerful, you can't miss it. And that's what I think is really great. Also, usually, monumental sized things are where the public can see it. Usually, smaller pieces, if the public is viewing it, it's somebody that has long died and it's in a museum. Mm -hmm. But if it's giant, that person might still be living. You can go downtown Old Town Scottsdale, and there's a ton of sculptures around that those people are still living. and. Their statement is being told to you right in the present. That contemporary, that that appeals to me. That now I'm going to make a statement, and more than one person are going to see that. That guy will be standing in Santa Fe, and hundreds and hundreds of people are going to see him and either be like, "Oh, he's so mean," or they're going to be like, "Wow, look at the power of that guy." And regardless of the response, I will have affected them, and that is you can't ask for more than that from an art. <laughs> how do you feel? This is your oh, first oh, year. That's like I want to ask you how. What does it mean to you when you get the emotional response from people when they see your work? Oh, okay. And I thought I remember you saying something about um, monumental works that were inspiring. Yes. As well. Yes. So I'll start with that. And uh, Augustus St. Gaudens uh, is one of my favorites, and the Shaw Memorial is, in my opinion, one of the most beautiful public works uh, in in the country. And um, and so that's always, uh, well, the story is very, I mean, how can you not know the history of that and not be affected by it somehow? Um, and again, so it's really, for me, human condition, a human condition, um, and our experiences is what affects me most in art. Um, and, and it's usually those that are people, uh, stories where they're not, uh, we're all important. And so, those that are maybe not seen as as important in their time, uh, but now, now, especially with that monument, they're being uh, they're being honored for their their service is is very touching. And I think in a in a way, we're all important enough that we we do we all deserve our own <laughs> memorial, right? Um, so uh, those are kind of things that I think of when when doing it, but. The fi I created a monument in Phoenix. It's the fire for the fire training academy, and I kind of had that in mind, uh, that monument in mind when doing it. It's a, it's it's a relief. It's low relief to high relief, 
and that happens to be kind of a similar. Um, in fact, if you're looking at that, those photos um, of Sabin's sculpture in there, and are familiar with the monument I'm talking about, you can see a lot of similarities in it. So, um, yeah, inspiration for, for that's coming. I don't know. <laughs> anyway, we, we, I guess we share a, a similar um, aesthetic. I'm not sure if I've answered the question. No, that's good. Right. And how do you feel when you get the emotional response? Well, I, that's why I do what I do. I, I don't... Um, there, there's, a, there's a certain amount of pleasure that comes myself to myself for being able to create something like that. But I've always been one who wants to please people and to bring joy into their lives. So it's, for me, it's the most important, it's the most important thing that there is. Uh, how does it affect me? Well, I, I'm not exactly sure how to answer that, except that it's, that's my purpose for doing what I do, is to bring enjoyment and enrichment to people's lives. So when I see them react in a, in a say, an emotional way, then it makes me want to become emotional with them. Very nice, you know? <laughs> Okay, not to be too deep. Let's move on to, we've talked about armatures and foam and clay and some of the process and the installation. Another area that people may not be as familiar with about sculpture, and bronze in particular, is how does it get the color because it's not painted exactly so who wants to talk about patinas anyone todd that's what i do that's having a foundry before sculpting allows you to go and truly appreciate when one of these geniuses make something and then the final product has gone through so many steps and they've controlled them to the point where what they wanted to say comes out is amazing because if like I always tell people uh, doing a patina is like doing a watercolor on a skillet so how would you get the watercolor to look like you want the, the it would sizzle and pop and everything would go everywhere and, and it does on a bronze when it's being patina those patinas jump and go every which way, and how do you get the beautiful patinas where the, the little inside details that, uh, or maybe even just a, a, the swipe of a thumbprint, or maybe it's the tool left, just these beautiful little, and you want that to be this milky little white color. But then you want right next to it to be this beautiful translucent bronze color, when we think of bronze, which is actually ferric nitrate, layers after layers after layers of it. How do you get those two? Because one is polished and then with layers of ferric on it, and the other is a real dusty with uh, maybe some titanium oxide or some bismuth nitrate to make that white color. How do you make those two sit right next to each other? If it's a mystery to you, it's a mystery to patina men too. <laughs> and they will figure out the techniques. And they, I have not seen one patina man do a patina exactly the same as another. It's impossible. And most patinas, if you notice, like Paul did, how many of these bears? 200? No, 25. 25. I was hoping it was 200. <laughs> it felt like 200. Felt like 200. <laughs> That's a long story. But the patina on every 25 of those is varied. It changes as it goes. There's no way he could have made every one the same unless they were painted on after. And here's the thing about painting bronzes is, is that even if you want an opaque color to happen, if you don't use the chemicals uh, and apply them in uh, a hot manner or with a cold patina that changes the chemically changes the bronze, if you just paint over bronze, it will look like plastic. And you just said, I don't care what this is made out of. <laughs> it's So the patina makes a piece either live or die. And I don't know if you've seen uh, Bryce's Bears, by the way, in my estimation, the most genius in, uh, uh, sculpture in the show right now is the three bears he's got, and they're still on the sprue cup that they were poured in 
and their patches have not been welded on. It's all a statement he's made, and it's awesome. I think it's genius. But if you look at the patinas on them, you're like, what? They're like crazy colors going on these bears, which is also a statement and is also genius in my estimation. But he used a dioxide that the bronze is glowing from within through that dioxide to make that beautiful color more than just spray paint on it, even though it's a bright blue spot on one of them and maybe orange on the top of the other. Uh, how the patina is done can make a piece just lift to a whole nother level. And uh, I think in times past, like if you think of a Remington or a Russell, they used a, like a Birchwood Casey, they, they made it black and that's what it was, it was black. The patina changed the, the bronze to being a black color and that's all it is. And that's a very traditional, and some people love that. I personally, it's not my style. But so much more can happen with a metal that can become illuminant in it. That uh, It's more difficult though, we're talking about monumental things, things that sit outside, because in, I was surprised the patina you had on the, the pelican because he had nice white colors happening. That's a very fragile patina. And if it's going to sit outside, this doesn't like outside. If you look at how he's burnished the corners, the edges of it, so he lets you know this isn't spray paint, this is bronze. Beautiful. But that's what the big one looked like. I was surprised because it's going to sit over a river. Are you kidding me? That's going to fail in like a half a year. <laughs> Still holding up. Still holding up. See, that's, that's a good patina man. He knows how to make it work. Because... Uh, signature too. Yeah, truly. I think that uh, uh, a monumental, if you see a colored patina on a monumental well done and it's lasting, there's some magic that has happened there. You've got, you've, you've seen genius in work and it wasn't the sculpting, it was the patina man. <laughs> Whether it was the sculptor who patinaed it or not, that is genius to be able to make that happen and, and last is, is pretty special because typically the sun and the rain, especially acid rain, will just chew a patina up and spit it out if it's not super well maintained. <laughs> that was great. And there are so many layers, I mean, I, and I love, I'm going to go back to the, there's 12 steps between that and that, and there was probably, that's step four, probably, at least, right there. Yeah, I got pictures of, uh, if you want to see what my process, if you want to see what my process was, come see me afterwards. I've got a few pictures of the of my process, which is nowhere near as sophisticated as, as Paul's process. Mine took a lot more grunt work and a lot more clay. <laughs> Experience. Yes. Yes. So I invite all of you to go to each one of their studios. Obviously, we know Todd Paxton is right here. Uh, just down the way to the left, you'll find Bryce Pettit and you can discover so much more about each of these artists. Um, Tyson, if you keep going to the end of this aisle and take a right, you'll see Tyson on the right-hand side. And Paul is over here um, on a wraparound space facing the courtyard and has some beautiful pieces out in the courtyard as well. And each of you have websites and Facebook pages, right? Yep. Um, so, you don't have a website? Uh, you have a website though. Yes. But, but most importantly, they're here and they're real and you can go talk to them and... and can they touch your pieces? Not the clay. Yes, mine. Sure. Okay. Don't touch artwork in a museum, but here... <laughs> right? But um, definitely please go visit and see and learn more about each of these amazing guys and their hardworking like, they're here in the morning grinding long before we open. They're staying late. Um, we could not be more proud of them and every one of the artists that, that participate here. So um, it's 5 o'clock, so we're going to wrap up. But if you have questions or want to stay and stick around and talk to these guys, please feel free. But let's give it up for this amazing